Good morning, everybody. It says right here that I'm Kathleen Parker of the Washington Post. <laughs> And it also says I'm delighted to lead this conversation, which I am. I hesitated exactly two seconds when I was asked to do this um, because the title intrigued me, Conservative Feminists, Why It's Not an Oxymoron. No tittering. That's a good sign. Um, so I'm joined here today by these uh, wonderful women, Rep Representative-elect Barbara Comstock, uh, Representative Susan Brooks, and Representative Marsha Blackburn. Senator Deb Fisher couldn't be with us, but um, we'll, we'll proceed. Ahoy. Um, so let's get started. We don't have a whole lot of time, and I know these women are dying to talk. Uh, they finally get to say their piece without being interrupted. <coughs> so the question is, is conservative feminism an oxymoron? Um, anybody who is familiar with my column knows that I don't think it is, but there are some members here um, who have actually been feminists for a very, very long time. Uh, Marsha, uh, Representative Blackburn, told me that she actually found an old news clip from 1972 where she was shattering a certain glass ceiling. She actually has proof here in case anyone needs evidence. Right, we had it. Um, we, oh yes, it did just fall off the screen, but we had it up. Um, talking about this, I talked a company into hiring me to go out and sell books door to door in the early 70s when I was in college. And well, of course, I was 10, that's right, no. Uh, when I was in college, and I not only was the first woman in the South to go out and do this, I became one of the first two sales managers for the company when I graduated from college. But while I was in college, I broke records. I shattered sales records, I built a, an enormous sales organization, and started a women's division of this company, the Southwestern Publishing Company, which was a part of Times Mira. And uh, we found this article cleaning out. It was from February 4th, 1972. Bookseller works to end sex discrimination. All right. So there All you right. go. <laughs> All right, so more, more to the point about uh, some of the issues that divide us today, and, and I want to hear each of you describe, well, first of all, just answer the question, are you a feminist, and if so, what does that mean to you? Want me to start? Yeah, let's just start. I, I think that you say uh, yes. If you look at the definition of working to open doors for women and to elevate women and to provide more opportunity and a level playing field for women, then yes, indeed, you are. My, the work that I do comes from the conservative side of the angle. I would say yes, I am as well. Have been my entire career after I got out of law school. I was one of the first um, female criminal defense attorneys in Indianapolis. There weren't many that practiced on that side of the criminal justice system. And then worked with uh, law enforcement after that as deputy mayor in Indianapolis and police and fire departments, often one of the only women in leadership in, in that role. And so to me, feminism really is about equal treatment, having unlimited opportunities and making sure people realize um, you know, that women should be given every opportunity that the men should be given. So yes, I do feel like I'm a feminist, and even more so here now that I'm in Congress. Okay, I'm gonna now request that you allow me to call you by your first names because it's just so cumbersome otherwise, and also I know Barbara a little bit, and uh, it would be odd to call her representative-elect. So Barbara, hit it. We know you've never worked okay. outside the home. <laughs> <laughs> yes, finally got a real job. Well, yes, no, I am from a family of uh, three girls. My, my mom was, uh, went to uh, college, graduate school, and everything as we were growing up, and she was a teacher. Um, she was from a family of two girls, and her sister had four girls. So growing up, it was my mom, her sister, and the seven girls. So my family has always been all girls, and, it, and I went, went to law school. I was first in my family to go to law school, and then I had two boys and a, and a daughter. And I remember one of my sons one time, because all of the women he knew were lawyers, he said, Mom, can boys be lawyers too? <laughs> so in my family, we never had, you know, it was, you, it was all about opportunity. It was... You know, my grandfather, who was so proud of his brood of nine women, 
Um, it was all about opportunity and education, and he just wanted to see everybody rise to the level of, of what they could uh, do. So uh, that's what it's always meant to me. And in my career, it was on Capitol Hill or in the Virginia State House, or as a small businesswoman, I've tended to have women in leadership positions. Uh, three of my four campaigns have been run by women. And um, that's unusual, actually, in the political world. Most on, on the political side, both Democrat and Republican, it's usually men. My male opponent had mostly male senior campaign operatives, and I had more women. Isn't it sad that you have to sit up here and explain yourselves, and you've got to <laughs> declare that somehow you merit uh, worthiness as, as a female candidate? I know you all are tired of that stereotype that... Republican women or conservative women are only uh, are part of this so-called war on women. I understand there was some there were some fireworks here this morning, and I'm sorry I missed that. Um, so let's create some here. <laughs> we know what we're really talking about here. It's the social issues that uh, are the big divide for conservative and liberal women. Um, I hate all the labels that we use uh, typically: pro-life, pro-choice. We're all pro-life, let's face it, okay? Nobody goes out of their way to have an abortion and say, oh, that was great, I think I'll do it again. But it is a, a serious issue. It's a place where the Republican Party has drawn a, a line. And so I guess my first question is, I want to get you all talking about this, because I think we have to somehow find a place to put reproductive rights so that we can communicate about other issues that may matter to everyone. <clears throat> now, let me just ask you this. How hard is it? Uh, dealing with Republican men. No, I have to say, in, in my case, it was Republican men who actually, because I think sometimes Republican men realize they, um, there's an issue here in terms of having more women. So I had my predecessor in Congress, Congressman Wolf, was the person who called me and asked me to do something which I had never thought of doing, which was to run for office in the State House. I didn't have any women who actually suggested I do that. Um, then the Speaker of the House, who was a male, um, called me and asked me also to run and thought I had said yes and actually announced to a room full of people that I was running before I had actually decided. But I liked him so much, and he really was... You know, yeah, he, it was an accident. He didn't mean to do it. But um, I jumped in and said, yes, I will run. And one of the reasons I've now started a young women's leadership program is I realized so many women hadn't been told by other women. I mean, I was really inspired by the Lean In book to, you know, how women wait until they say, you have to be 150% qualified, whereas often others will say, well, I'll learn all those other things that I don't know. So I've started with a high school program where we get young women exposed to women in leadership positions to hear their stories. And what I've found, Republican, Democrat, doctor, lawyer, whatever it is, their stories are very similar and cross, and, and oftentimes it's their mothers and their families who are very strong advocates for them. Education was, you know, a, a big piece of it. And flexibility and have, and oftentimes doing a career path in a very different way than men would. But it's been very helpful for these young girls as they're looking at their careers to hear how women do things differently. And so often, um, usually those social issues don't come up. I mean, I'm proud in my party, Republican Party, I have people on both sides of those issues. We don't have a dividing line of you're not welcome. I think our party is actually more welcoming if you have differing views on that. And that's certainly been the case in my races. Well, that was a very serious uh, answer to um, a sort of unserious question. I was thinking more about the Republican men who say such outrageous things that women, you know, grab their bags and say, well, I'm definitely out of this party because there's no place for them. The gender gap is real. And as long as you have Republican men being taught how to speak to women, um, then you, you, you do have a bit of a problem. And I was just thinking that as women, you might have some tips for them. And how can you address the gender gap and attract women to, you know, convince women that you have a place for them in the GOP? I need to kind of defend Indiana a little bit because that happened in Indiana when I was running for office. Our Senate candidate did make an incredibly offensive remark uh, regarding rape, but I always like to remind people, and I'm going to defend Indiana at this point, because Indiana right now 
all of our three, from lieutenant governor to three female statewide candidates, just one election in Indiana. So for the statewide candidates in Indiana, the governor and the attorney general are men, but everyone else are women. And Senator Luger has been an incredible leader in Indiana, started what was called the Luger Excellence in Public Service Series to try to get women to come um, and be a part of a year-long series to educate women about all levels of government, about ways to get involved, about contemplating running for office. And so I've been really thrilled to have been a part of that, to have been a lecturer of that, to have received an award from that series. And, so he, and it's been in existence for about 25 years. And so he reached out to two women 25 years ago to get more women to come into politics. And so what I think has happened is that on occasion, we have a candidate or an elected official who makes a very stupid and horrible remark. And unfortunately, the brush is painted far too broadly to us as a party. And it's not the case. And so um, I will tell you that when that remark was made, Kelly Ayotte, decided not to get a, to, on a plane and come into Indiana. I turned around and decided not to support you know, this candidate who I was really not that familiar with his positions or certainly how he would say things. And I have to tell you that you know, we took a stand as Republican women and said, you know, this is not our party. This is not about the Republican men or the women. And so I think we just have to realize that on occasion when candidates in our party or candidates in the other party make stupid <laughs> remarks, it's really that individual. It does doesn't represent a party. Well, it was true when, in, in Barbara's case, when she was running, a, a Democrat male said something that was so foolish that I thought it might have been Republican. No, I'm just teasing. Uh, <laughs> said that, oh my goodness, we have some Republicans out there. You know, I'm, I'm kidding, okay? But he, what he said, this woman has never had a job, so that was a, you know, you sort of are grateful for opportunities like that to respond. <laughs> So that was, the press did not pay attention until you, uh, you did and some other women did. But initially, when we called, actually, the Washington Post, the male reporter said, I don't think that's an issue. I don't think that's, and, and we had so many women respond to that. The reason you know about it and you've heard about it is because there were outside ads that actually highlighted it and focused on it when the press didn't. And so the attention given in the case of Indiana was earned media. In, in my race, it was there was total silence um, from most of the mainstream media on that. Well, I think and, that's a very important point. Obviously, the media uh, determines what people know about what occurs and in, in wherever it's happening. So you, uh, notwithstanding your first uh, 1972 coverage, do you all find it difficult to get coverage for your positions and for the legislation that you that you uh, write and that sort of thing? Well, what sort of obstacles do you? Yeah, it doesn't come to us as quickly many times as it does to one of the our male colleagues, and you have to be more creative in making opportunities to get press. And then you have to realize that nobody is going to tell your story or cover your story. That is going to be up to you to make certain that you are telling your story and that you're going to have other individuals supporting you. Now, uh, at Energy and Commerce, I serve as vice chair of that committee. I do a lot of the technology policy and the healthcare policy that we utilize and push forward at that committee. And it's always interesting to me, it may be my bill, but it may be the Senate co-sponsor who is a male who's going to end up getting the majority of the press. So we find ourselves going back and inserting ourselves into those stories, or if you will, correcting the record. Because if you don't say that part of this credit belongs to me, I can guarantee you the press is not going to give you that credit. So it's important to, um, to get out there and set that record straight, like Barbara had to do in her campaign, and that uh, Susan and I do as we are bringing forward legislation. All right, we only have four minutes left, if you can believe that, and um, we've been so civilized. Um, this <laughs> But I did want you all to each have an opportunity <clears throat> to say the one thing that you would like people to know 
about Republican women and about their role? In other words, how, how are you going to attract the women in this group, the younger women coming along who have never lived in a world without reproductive choice? How do you draw them to the, to the Republican Party? I think there are plenty who, are, who want to see market-driven solutions to problems, but that is a, you know, that's a no deal. That's a deal breaker. Is there anything that can be done about that? I think there are some things that can be done. Number one, the number one issue with women is jobs in the economy. And women want to know that they're going to have the opportunity to excel and the opportunity to hit a higher rung on the ladder. Uh, shattering the glass ceilings certainly still exist. Uh, you all had something this morning about the rarity of female CEOs. And so whether it's the corporate world or the political world, still those opportunities. And I think part of this is holding men accountable. When they skip a woman who should be next in line for something, pointing that out to them and holding them accountable and saying, no, so-and-so should be the one who gets that gavel or who has that opportunity to make their case because you can't guarantee results, but you can guarantee access to opportunity. I think the political world really kind of follows what we're seeing um, throughout our country. We know we need more women in leadership in the C-suites or in the big corporations. We know we need to promote more women-owned businesses, and we need to make sure that women who are leading companies, large and small, have the opportunities that their male counterparts have. And same thing in the House and in the Senate. We need more women. We need more women to consider running. We need more women to consider running. Maybe you don't start like we did with Congress for our first runs for office, but you run for school board, or you run for city council, or you run for mayor. We need more female governors leading the country, and yet we need to support each other, and we need to support each other, quite frankly, in both parties. Both parties, we only have, I think we're gonna have 83 women in the House of Representatives. That's out of 435, and we're 52% of the electorate. Now the Senate, believe it or not, is doing a little bit better. We're gonna have 20 women senators um, out of the hundred. And so we just have to support each other, not tear each other down so much. And I'm certainly hoping, hoping that we do have women, you know, at the national level just willing to step up, willing to speak out, and then willing to support each other. Okay, Okay. Well, and I'd, I'd like to thank actually these women and all of the women in the Republican caucus because what they did this year is they really came to a lot of us women who were running and supported us from the very start in the primaries. You know, I think they came out, saw candidates and did that. And then we worked together on an agenda that was very much focused on the issues that we heard from women on. Jobs, certainly number one. Um, technology gives us a lot of freedom. I, I passed telework bills in Virginia. So anything that's about flexibility and giving people more opportunity and advancing in ways that might not be the same as men have or traditional ways, but men want those changes too. I mean, a lot of men, I mean, women are 40% of the top earners now. There's a lot of two earner families who need flexibility for the whole family. So I think we have a great opportunity to talk across party lines, talk within families, and provide more flexibility and opportunity as we go forward. And that's what I've heard in my district that people would like. Okay, well, unfortunately, we're out of time. This is still working. And um, thank you all for sharing your insight.